Thank you for the introduction. So this is joint work with Rahul Sharma, Alex Aiken, and Percy Liang. So consider a program that takes structured inputs, in particular strings and some context-free language, uh, such as XML. For such a program, it's often useful to have the program's input grammar. For example, uh, if you want to fuzz test the program, that is, generate a bunch of random inputs, use these inputs to test the program, and try to find bugs, then it's useful to have the program input grammar so you can do grammar-based fuzzing and get improved coverage. Um, alternatively, you might want to use the grammar to construct a whitelist of valid inputs that you can use to reduce the risk of security vulnerabilities due to invalid inputs. And finally, the program input grammar is often useful um, for a security analyst who's trying to reverse engineer the functionality of a suspicious program binary. However, oftentimes the input grammar is unavailable in practice, or at least not available in machine-readable form. And the goal of our work is to try and automatically infer the program input grammar. So our algorithm only requires two inputs. First, it requires an example of what a valid program input looks like, uh, such as the XML string shown on the slide. And it also requires black box access to the program. So it doesn't need to analyze the program at all, but it does need to be able to run the program and observe its outputs. And in particular, our algorithm will leverage black box access to do active learning. So during the course of its execution, it's going to devise new inputs alpha, run the program on alpha, and observe the program output. If the program ever prints a parse error, then our algorithm will conclude that alpha is not a valid input. Otherwise, it will conclude that alpha is a valid input. And our algorithm will use this information to guide the learning process. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to refer to um, the program input language as the target language. And I'm also going to abstract away black box access to the program as um, having an oracle O that on a given string alpha either returns one if alpha is a valid input or zero otherwise. Uh, so given these inputs, our grammar synthesis algorithm uh, will use an active learning strategy to learn a grammar that approximates the target language. The key idea behind our algorithm is to construct a series of increasingly general languages. So just to give some intuition, uh, let the blue oval here represent the target language that we're trying to learn. Then the idea is that the, our algorithm will start from the singleton language containing the one input we know for sure is in the target language, namely the given input example. And then it's going to incrementally try and grow this language to capture more and more of the target language. Um, so on the one hand, it wants to capture as much of the target language as possible. On the other hand, it really doesn't want to overgeneralize. That is, include invalid inputs in the learned language. And I'll describe how our algorithm balances these two competing objectives. So um, just to make things concrete with our ex uh, example, so we're going to start with the given input, um, alpha in. So this is the singleton language containing that input. And then uh, we're going to, at least initially, generalize this string to a regular expression. Um, and eventually, we'll also generalize it to a context-free grammar. And I'll describe how that's done later. And each of, I'm going to refer to each of these successive generalizations as a generalization step. For a given generalization step, I'm going to refer to the current language as li and the generalized language as li plus 1. So we want generalization steps to satisfy two properties. First, we want them to be monotone. That is, we want the generalized language to contain the uh, current language. We also want them to be precise. That is, we want the generalized language to be contained in the target language. So monotonicity intuitively, uh, or captures our intuition that the, we're incrementally growing this language to capture as much of the um, target language as possible, and precision captures the intuition that we don't want to overgeneralize. So now I'll give a high-level overview of how a single generalization step works. So first we're going to start with the current language, and the first thing our algorithm is going to do is construct a set of candidate generalizations. So it's eventually going to pick one of these to be the generalized language. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how these candidates are constructed later. 
It's also going to rank these candidates in order of preference. So uh, the top candidate is the most preferred generalization, and the bottom candidate is the least preferred generalization. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about how the preference ranking is constructed, except to say that it's done so in a way that ensures that we don't miss out on any potential generalizations. So once it's constructed the candidates, the next thing our algorithm is going to do is try uh, go down the list of candidates and try and check whether each of them is precise. So our algorithm will conclude that the first candidate is precise, um, the candidate in the middle is imprecise, and the candidate shown at the bottom is precise as well. And because we've already ranked the candidates in order of preference, our algorithm is going to choose the generalized language to be just the first precise candidate. Okay, so now I'm going to describe how our algorithm checks for precision. So ideally, the property we want to check is that for every alpha in the candidate language, um, for example, the language shown in blue here, alpha is also contained in the target language. In other words, if we query the oracle, it always responds one. The problem is that the generalized language is typically infinitely large, so we can't possibly check this property exactly. So instead, what our algorithm is going to do is basically make a best effort. So it's going to choose a finite subset of checks from the generalized language and only query the oracle on this finite subset. And as long as all of these checks um, pass the oracle, then our uh, algorithm will conclude that the candidate is potentially precise. And in practice, this finite subset of checks is chosen so that um, it typically rejects imprecise candidates. So instead of uh, checking for precision, our algorithm will check for potential precision. And I've shown some of the checks devised by our algorithm in the third panel. As you can see, um, basically, these are all for inserting a repetition. And it basically just um, either deletes the string in the candidate repetition or duplicates it twice. And uh, as you can see, it pretty easily rejects the middle candidate as being imprecise, since the two checks are not valid XML inputs. So there's one more problem, which is that now that we're only checking for potential precision, we might have made mistakes along the way. And if we made mistakes in the past, then what's going to happen is that there's no way our current language is, or, or sorry, that any of our candidates are precise. So if we do find a mistake in a previous step, we could potentially backtrack, um, but that can be very inefficient. So instead, we're just going to treat these mistakes as sunk cost and ignore them. So we're going to modify our definition of precision basically to only consider strings that are newly added to the language. So we want to make sure all of these newly added strings are contained in the target language. Um, so this definition of this uh, check for potential precision, we just ignore the strings in the current language. Um, so now we can check for potential precision as before. And uh, now I'll describe how we uh, how our algorithm constructs the candidate generalizations. So our algorithm actually constructs candidate generalizations in three different phases. Uh, and these three phases are basically separated just to kind of give our algorithm some kind of modularity. So as I uh, said before, our algorithm is going to start from the singleton language containing just the input example. And in the first phase, it's going to generalize this language to a regular expression. In particular, at each step in the first phase, it's going to consider candidates that insert a single repetition or alternation construct into the current regular expression. So it's always going to pick some constant string of terminals. Um, so in the first step, it's going to pick the entire string. Here, it's going to pick the substring high and insert a repetition around that. And then it's going to insert an alternation between the H and the I. So it'll consider candidates that insert a single repetition or alternation construct. So once it can't find any more um, potential generalizations, uh, then the first phase is complete, and our algorithm will begin the second phase. Uh, but before it does so, it first translates the regular expression directly to a, uh, an equivalent context-free grammar. In particular, the context-free grammar shown on the last line encodes the same language as the, rep as the regular expression shown on the previous line. So in the second phase, um, the, our algorithm is going to consider basically equating pairs of non-terminals in the context-free grammar. 
So in this example, our algorithm has equated the non-terminals B and A in order to get this generalized language at the bottom. And by doing so, um, we can induce recursive constructs analogous to matching parentheses that are not expressible by regular languages. And finally, in a third phase, our algorithm is just going to go through the constant symbols in the context-free grammar and try to generalize those as much as possible. Um, so in our example, we've generalized the H and the I symbols to be any um, alphabetical character. Okay, so those are the candidates constructed by our algorithm in three different phases. So finally, I'll describe an extension to handle multiple input examples. So, so far, I've assumed that our algorithm is given just a single example of a valid input. If instead our algorithm is given um, multiple input examples, alpha 1 through alpha k, uh, then it's going to actually apply the first phase um, that is generalizing to regular expressions independently to each of these given input examples. So we get regular expressions R1 through RK. And now we're going to have an additional step where we just combine the learned regular expressions using an alternation. So this regular expression R is just R1 or R2 or so and so on and so forth or RK. And now we'll proceed with the um, second and third phase using the combined regular expression R uh, the same way as before. So we used two experiments to evaluate our grammar synthesis algorithm. Uh, in the first experiment, we're going to com uh, compare to a number of existing language learning algorithms. And in the second experiment, we're going to actually use our grammar synthesis algorithm in an applica application to fuzz testing. And we're going to compare to a number of existing fuzzers. So uh, in the grammar experiment, Grammar learning experiment, we compare it to two baseline language learning algorithms. Uh, first, the L star algorithm, and also RP and I. Uh, so for L star, we actually had to use a variant of L star that does not use an equivalence oracle, because we don't have one available. Um, so this variant actually comes from the original paper, and use, it uses sampling to implement the equivalence oracle, approximately. And it comes with pack learnability guarantees instead of exact learning guarantees. And we're going to compare on a number of kind of typical grammars, um, just URL, grep, lisp, like a lisp-like language, and XML. And for each of these algorithms, they're going to be given access to the membership oracle, um, as long as 50 random positive examples, and also five minutes of computation time. So we time out the learning after five minutes. So to compare the, to compare the quality of the learned grammar from each of the the learned language from each of the algorithms, we're going to use the F1 score, which is a standard metric for combining precision and recall. So basically, to get high F1 score, you have to both get high precision and get high recall. So in this plot, I'm going to show the F1 score of each of the algorithms. So for L star, the F1 score is shown in white. For RP and I, it's shown in gray. And finally, for a grammar synthesis algorithm, it's shown in black. So as you can see, we do better than L star and RP and I across the board. Uh, and that holds true even on the URL language, which is actually a regular language. And for regular languages, L star and RP and I come with theoretical guarantees. And as you can see, even with those theoretical guarantees, our uh, grammar synthesis algorithm performs substantially better. So um, we also compared the running times of the algorithms. Uh, so in white, I'm showing the running time of L star. Um, and in gray, I'm showing the running time of RP and I. And in black, I'm showing the running time of our grammar synthesis algorithm. And again, as you can see, our synthesis algorithm um, outperforms L star and RP and I uh, for almost all of the test cases. In our second experiment, we're going to consider an application of our approach to fuzzing. In particular, we implemented a grammar-based fuzzer. So our fuzzer is first going to use our algorithm to synthesize a program input grammar. So initially, it doesn't know anything about the input grammar. It, and then it synthesizes the program input grammar and uses that grammar in conjunction with a standard grammar-based fuzzer. In particular, this grammar-based fuzzer constructs the parse tree for an input example. And it's going to randomly resample subtrees of this parse tree in order to obtain new inputs. So we compared to two baseline fuzzers. Uh, first, we compared to a naive fuzzer that just randomly inserts and deletes characters. 
And we also compare it to AFL fuzz, which is a production fuzzer developed at Google. And we compare it on a kind of standard benchmark of programs that take structured inputs. Uh, I should note that for the programming language interpreters, we had to, so the input languages for programming language interpreters have a lot of semantic constraints that are non-context free and can't currently be handled by our algorithm. So for those, we're restricting to just testing the parser. And finally, we gave each of the, we sampled 50,000 random samples from each of the fuzzers and used these samples to evaluate the quality of our, uh, of, of each of the fuzzers. In particular, we're going to look at coverage to compare the different fuzzers. So because we're trying to measure coverage on deeper code pads, we restricted to just the number of lines uh, covered by valid inputs as a fair comparison. And additionally, a lot of these, um, a lot of lines of code in these binaries are trivially covered by the given input examples. So we're going to restrict to just the coverage, the newly covered lines of code beyond the given input examples. Uh, and that's going to be called the incremental coverage. And finally, just to enable comparison across programs, we're going to normalize by the incremental coverage of the naive fuzzer. So in this plot, I'm going to show the normalized incremental coverage of each of the three fuzzers. Because we've normalized by the naive fuzzer, that's always going to be one. So that's shown as the black dotted line. <clears throat> AFL fuzz is shown as the white bars. So you'll note that we actually don't have any coverage for um, JavaScript. This is the uh, spider monkey interpreter, uh, JavaScript interpreter in Fider Firefox. And that's because we couldn't actually get AFL fuzz to work correctly with that program. And finally, uh, in black, we have the normalized incremental coverage of our grammar-based fuzzer. So the median improvement over the naive baseline was about 2x. So there was one program where we did a little bit worse, which is the SED program. And that's because most of the inputs for SED are actually valid. If you basically pick a random SED input, it turns out it's valid with pretty high probability. So the grammar uh, inference didn't help as much there. So um, also just to give an idea of how the, perform the um, coverage scales over time, uh, we looked at this in one instance. This is for Python. So I've shown the normalized incremental coverage of the naive fuzzer as the black dotted line. So we normalized by the final value here, which is why, it, so it starts at zero and it goes to one at the end. Um, so AFL fuzz is shown as the black, so that line's supposed to be dotted. Uh, but yeah, that's AFL fuzz. And finally, the grammar-based fuzzer is shown in uh, black. So again, we do consistently better. And even towards the end, we're still increasing faster than the other two fuzzers. Um, and finally, we, just, we also compared uh, on two of the programs to a handwritten grammar-based fuzzer. Um, so again, we're showing the naive uh, normalized incremental coverage as the black dotted line. Um, so our grammar-based fuzzer is shown in white, uh, and the handwritten fuzzer is shown in black. So again, for grep, the difference is actually not too um, much for the same reason as said. Uh, but as you can see, for the XML parser, we actually do substantially, we, we recover most of the difference between the naive fuzzer and the handwritten fuzzer. So just to conclude, um, kind of backing up a little bit and generalizing, I think learning program properties from input-output examples is a very exciting and kind of underexplored problem. And I think it's really interesting because it's, we have this kind of extreme form of active learning where you can really query a bunch of inputs and find the corresponding outputs in order to guide the learning process. And I think there's a lot of future work to be done in this direction. Um, so with that, I'll conclude, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, in our experiments, I think they actually came out, they're usually very precise. We tried very hard not to overgeneralize. So when they do um, have problems, they're under approximations. But to get high F1 score, you really have to have both um, good precision and good recall. 
Right. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you. Good stuff. Um, uh, I have over 9,000 uh, questions, but I will ask two of the simplest ones. First of all, is your tool available for you somewhere? Um, so we do have a version of our tool available that's open source. You can find it on my website. Um, and we're hoping to update it. It doesn't have all the functionality currently, but we're hoping to include more. The grammar learning algorithm itself is there. Oh, OK. Yeah. That's the most important part. And um, the second is, uh, where does the limitation for five minutes uh, uh, come from? Because it mostly killed your uh, competitors. And grammar inference methods are, uh, how to put it, not known for their for performance. Yeah, well, we took the best of it. Whatever it learned so far after five minutes, we took that. And it was, um, yeah, the cutoff was chosen kind of arbitrarily. But even if you let it run for much longer, it doesn't do much better. Because, as you know, they're really, really slow. So. I'm curious about, for the fuzzing, whether instead of learning a grammar and then doing the sampling from the grammar for fuzzing, whether you could basically be, I mean, essentially learning the grammar is fuzzing, right? You're calling the program and it's either crashing or not crashing uh, according to the input. So I wonder if you could just couple these two things and con the grammar while fuzzing. Um, I think that's uh, definitely possible. It's not something we've tried yet, but it's a good suggestion. Thank you. Thanks. That was a very fun talk. Um, Thank you. I've Two simple questions. So the first one is, uh, um, why do you rank the candidates before um, checking for precision? Aren't you also interested in sort of a balance between monotonicity and precision? So don't um, you, yeah. Well, we, we want to, yeah, you're right. We always want to only pick precise candidates whenever possible. So the ranking is just basically out of the ones we know are precise, which is the best one, right? So. Um, we, yeah, that, that's how the ranking is kind of combined with precision. OK, and the second one is just for some context, so to speak. Uh, what's the sort of, how would you classify the category of grammars that you, know, you can synthesize? Um, so we've targeted, so um, we, we don't have a, so we can learn things like matching parentheses grammars and a lot of um, like generalized matching parentheses kinds of constructs that are typical of programming languages. Yeah, and we do have a kind of, formalization of that in our paper, uh, which you can take a look at. Thanks. So I had a question on the kind of, <clears throat> on the kind of queries you generate to the Oracle. So one is you just run an input, and then you can classify yes, no, right? Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so a lot of the work on synthesis kind of has different differencing questions. Like you have several candidates, so you want to generate an input that differentiates them. So many queries of this kind. Do you <clears throat> have you looked at this? Uh, just posing different queries to the Oracle. Yeah, the or the queries to the Oracle are constructed on the fly to kind of differentiate between different possible generalizations. So yeah, it's active learning in that sense. For the more complicated grammars, like uh, for the programming languages, how do they look like compared to the kind of grammar that you would write by hand? Is um, I haven't looked at any of the programming language grammars because those tend to get really large. But for the simpler languages, at least, um, they, they're pretty, I mean, they're different than the ones you would write by hand for sure. But um, you can look at them and they look correct. We actually looked at the XML grammar and it, it covers all the functionalities that you would expect. And in our paper, we have examples of learned grammars you can look at. I have a question about how you learn the match parenthesis grammar. So your slides showed an example where by introducing a star, you could get uh, left paren to the I, right paren to the I. But for a match parenthesis grammar, like what you have in Lisp, you need matched goes to matched matched. And I didn't see where that kind of production would, would, uh, would get introduced. Um, so I guess the version of the match parentheses grammar we learn is a little bit different. But it basically comes from the merging step. And basically, you can say that the um, S can go to open parentheses, S close parentheses. Oh, yeah, and sorry, it's so, so it's going to be S star. So you can have, it, it'll learn that the S in the inside can be repeated as well. That's correct. I know there are other questions, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So let's thank Ospart and take this offline.